All right, I gotta be honest. I feel a little bad about what I'm about to do here, but it's sort of like a Band-Aid. We gotta rip it off. It's something you have to learn at some point or another, so we might as well dig into it. But yeah, just, just trust me when I say, I understand when you see some of this, you're gonna say, oh, what the hell, Jeff? This is, this is totally different. Uh, but the truth is, it really isn't that different. It's just another thing that you have to learn. So I sympathize, but we gotta do it. All right, let's rip the Band-Aid off. All right, in my project, let's have a look at any of these page views. How about this one right here? And I wanna point your attention to this script that looks pretty different from what we've been used to. First of all, what is this setup here? We never looked at that. Now, to be honest, there's actually a couple things going on here. We have a macro setup as well as a different API entirely. But first, why don't we just reproduce this the way uh, that we are comfortable with? We import our component, and then we export an object where we register the component. So this probably feels a little more comfortable to you. And in fact, I have npm run dev running in the background. So if I switch to the browser, yeah, everything works great. So um, yeah, what's going on here? Why do we have two different ways to do things? All right, I have a handful of tabs that we need to go over. Let's go to the Vue.js website into the documentation. And immediately at the top, we see this API preference, options or composition. So as it turns out in Vue, there are two different ways that we can organize and structure our code. Now, this is actually a relatively new thing as of Vue 3.0. Originally, when Vue first launched, we only had the options API. And as it turns out, the options API is everything that I've been showing you so far in this series. And keep in mind, it's not deprecated, it's not going away, it's just a slightly different way of structuring your projects. And that's really important for me to get across. In no way is the Options API wrong or deprecated or incorrect by any stretch. It's just a different way of doing things with some pros and some cons associated with it. But now the Composition API, this is something we haven't yet reviewed yet. So why don't we have a look? If I click on the question mark here, we can see a comparison of the different API styles. So yeah, notice right here with the Options API, we are used to exporting an object that consists of, well, all of the options. What should happen uh, when this lifecycle hook fires? Uh, what kind of reactive data should this component keep track of? And it's all contained within a single object. However, the Composition API is a little bit different. Notice with Composition API, we define a component's logic using imported API functions. And notice it is typically used with script setup. Now, setup is just an attribute that we add to the script tag that behind the scenes, the compiler will pick up on and then apply a series of transformations to make everything work uh, the way you'd expect. So that's what I mean earlier when I said there's kind of two different things going on here. Yes, we're switching over to the composition API, but we're also making use of a, a hook, basically, a macro that will compile everything down to provide a, a bit more convenience. And yeah, I bet that can be a little confusing. Okay, next tab. So we can see Composition API is a set of APIs that allow us to author view components using imported functions instead of declaring options. So notice that Composition API is basically an umbrella term for these three uh, sub APIs. One for reactivity, that's the stuff that we stored in the data method before, or it's your computed properties. It's things that view needs to keep track of and react to. Next, we have lifecycle hooks. Do this when the component updates or when the component is created or when the component is mounted. And then there's also an API to help with dependency injection. We haven't reviewed this just yet. That's a bit more of an advanced topic, uh, but we'll definitely get to it soon. So if we wanted to play around with this, yeah, what you see here is us leveraging the options API. So if we wanted to do something when the component is mounted, I could say, I have been mounted. Uh, if we want some reactive data, then we could, as we've always done, return an object. Hello world, like so, and reformat. And then maybe down here, we could have our message. Yeah, all of this should be very much a recap for you. And if I switch to Chrome, there's the alert, and there is the message. Okay, so let's switch this over to the Composition API, and we're gonna do it in two steps. 
First, we'll migrate to the composition API, and then second, we will return that script setup attribute, like this, that will add a few conveniences. Okay, so first up, we're gonna get rid of all of this, we'll comment it out, and I will add a setup method. And notice that keyword setup, very similar to what we had up here. Okay, so now in our setup method, I will return any data that should be reactive, like this. Return, message is hello world. Okay, so now if I come back and give this a refresh, that all still works. Okay, so now I can see when I'm using the composition API, I can create a setup method and if I return an object from that setup method, it's almost equivalent to our options API where we returned an object, but now we do it from setup. But next I want to display an alert when the component is mounted. And you'll remember if we switch back, composition API consists of a set of APIs that we import. And one of those APIs is the various lifecycle hooks. Okay, so we're going to import that now. Import on mounted from view. And this is kind of a key thing with the composition API. When I want to perform various actions, whether it's uh, doing something when the component is mounted or declaring a computed property or a reactive property, we will import only the things that we actually need for the current component. Okay, so now I could say in the setup method, when this component mounts, I want to alert. Hi there. Okay, so now if I come back, sure enough, we get our alert and we have our message. Okay, so again, notice how it's just a slightly different way of doing things. But now there's still more confusion here. Let's do this. Let's come back down where we have our message and let's add another paragraph where we have an input and I will set vModel to that message. Okay, so if I come back, notice if I change this, oh, that's not what we expected, is it? I changed the input, we're using vModel, so I would have expected this input change to update the underlying message property, but it didn't. But it did when we were using the options API. Okay, so this is an important thing to understand. Right now we've returned message, but we haven't declared that it should be treated as reactive data. Right now it's just a string. And in fact, we could create a message here Hello world. But yeah, it's not gonna make any difference. So refresh, and if we change the input, it is not updating the underlying property. Okay, so when we're using the composition API, we need to be explicit about these things. And this is where, if we switch back, one of the other APIs comes into play, the reactivity API. And specifically, we're gonna take a look at ref in this episode. This allows us to directly create reactive state, computed state, and watchers. Okay, let's give it a shot. So this is what I mean. It gets a little confusing until you grasp some of these basic concepts. And then trust me, you'll be able to go back and forth between the options API and the composition API without even thinking. It's just that initial uh, roadblock as you figure out what some of these concepts are. Okay, so now I will declare that message should be reactive. So I wrap it within a ref. Okay, so if I come back and give this a refresh, I bet it's going to work now. I change the input, and now we also update the underlying property. But it actually gets even a little more tricky. So let me show you something. First, let's get rid of unmounted. That was only an example. But next, what if I were to say, well, set a timeout, and let's do this. After two seconds, update the message property to I have been changed. And uh, yeah, think to yourself, will this work? Well, we'd expect it to, but if we come back and give it a refresh, one, two, keep your eyes down here, nothing happens at all. And yeah, this is usually the point when people are learning the composition API and they put their hands up in the air and they say, what the hell? Like, I understood the options API, it made perfect sense, and now you're throwing all this new stuff at me, nothing works, nothing makes sense, what's the point of this? Why do I need two different ways to do the exact same thing? And you know what, I think a lot of us felt that way, at least initially, and then the more you stick with it, you start to realize, oh, you know what, there are some benefits to doing it this way. But, but the most important thing I want to impress upon you is that, again, the options API is not the old way. It is not the deprecated way. I'm gonna say that over and over. You can stick with it. You can stick with it exclusively if you want. And, and maybe that would actually be a good way to go. 
uh, because then as you learn more, you might run into situations where you realize, oh, in some cases, components start to get really cluttered and really messy. And then when I want to share code across components, it gets even messier. And that's where the, the true flexibility of the Composition API uh, comes into play. Okay, so as it turns out, we actually have to do message.value. And again, you're thinking, oh, good grief, now it works. Okay, so as it turns out, when we create a ref that returns an object, it will make this string reactive, and then the value of the string is accessible through a property called value. So when you're using the Composition API and you have reactive data, you need to remember to always access that data by using message.value, excluding the template. Notice in the template, I don't say message.value. Okay, so that is the absolute basics of the Composition API. But now let's move on to the second part where we added script setup. So as it turns out, when we use this attribute setup, we're basically turning on a compiler macro that will make the code a little more friendly to write. And it's no coincidence that this and this method name are the same. All right, so check this out, and I'll show you a few benefits. First up, when we switch to script setup, you no longer have to import a component and then register it. And in fact, we can get rid of this components object instantly. And this is actually pretty cool. When I want to import a view component and then use it in my template, all I have to do is import it and then it's magically available in my template. All right, so that's benefit number one. And I know that may seem like a small thing, but that is in my mind like a huge win. I really love that. Okay, next, this setup method and this method, well, what if I just took all of this out, got rid of the exported object entirely, and then pasted in the contents of that original setup method? Okay, but what about this where we're returning nothing? Well, as it turns out with script setup, yeah, I don't need to return anything. In fact, all I have to do is define it, and then once again, it's magically available in my template. So yeah, notice how we just get rid of the clutter here and it becomes much more terse. If I come back to Chrome, give it a refresh, this should all still work, and it does. But now we are leveraging the Composition API as well as script setup. Okay, now, if I haven't introduced enough new concepts in this video, we're gonna do one more, but uh, it's still in the experimental stages. So let's return to this message.value section here. Um, as you can imagine, when people first learned about this, they were a little critical. Uh, many people said, you know what, this is annoying. I will constantly forget to tack on message.value to any of my reactive properties. And um, it's valid, I I've forgotten many times myself. So they've toyed around with how to solve this. Uh, and one option is again through a macro. So just keep in mind, once again, this is at the time of this recording, an experimental feature, which means we have to turn it on. Let's play around with it. Let's go to my Vite configuration file, and I will pass an object to the view plugin where I will turn on reactivity transforms, like this. Okay, so now we've enabled that experimental feature. So now what we can do is I no longer have to import ref, I can instead use this magic variable, dollar sign ref. And when we use it like this, yeah, I no longer have to tack on dot value. And that's because once again, the compiler will take care of it for you. So it's a bit of a helper. And yeah, again, you can tell it's in experimental stages because right now ESLint is a little confused by it. Let's suppress it for now. Okay, and this should work exactly the way it did before. Come back, give it a refresh, one, two, and we should see that our reactivity is in fact working. Yeah, and if this isn't too overwhelming for you, I actually think all of this is incredibly cool. Because think about it, now when I want to define my components, I will create a script tag, I add the setup attribute, and then I no longer have to register all of my components, I don't have to create a data method that returns an object. Instead, if I wanna use a piece of data, then I just define it like a variable. And if I want that data to be reactive, then I wrap it in ref. Next, if I wanna create a method, do something, then I just create a method and then I can reference it in my template. Like that. Now I have a function that I can call. So let's do, 
you know, super quickly. Button, click me. When you click on it, call, do something. All right, refresh, click on it. Yeah, so all of these things ultimately end up being so much simpler. But yeah, you, you would be forgiven if your first thought is, nope, I'm good with the Options API. I'm going to stick with it. And uh, it's totally fine. If you feel that way, then do it. But nonetheless, these are things that you need to learn. You're going to encounter it in the real world. And my guess is, if not now, eventually you're going to switch over to this.